Hello friends, Dave Pilatus, k Missing Project, a copyrighted edition for my video channel. And you're here. This is a missing persons video. Update on Montana. Uh, we have about 30 mile an hour, 35 mile an hour wind gusts right now. It's rained a little bit up here in far northern Montana, uh, Columbia Falls area. And still within a couple feet of flood stage on the south fork of the Flathead. But we're doing good. Uh, Yellowstone National Park just announced that they're gonna open under a limited arrangement later on this week. If you're headed to Yellowstone, personally, there's no way I'd go now. The infrastructure's really bad and I think you need a reservation, so make sure you check. Glacier National Park is still open, no infrastructure issues just make sure you have a park reservation to get in because you have to have that so other than that everyone's doing fine huck's doing well a uh, couple small things i just want to discuss lots of comments about where i'm in may end up on what uh, what platform with this video and um uh, as I asked all of you, if you know positively that the site has all the requirements I need to go there, then tell me. But don't say, eh, how about this one or how about that one? I've, I've ran down, down those rabbit holes way too many times. I'm not doing that again. So there's been a couple people that have written to me that have explained what's going on out there and none of it is good. Somebody, somebody needs to build a new platform maybe Elon will be interested but if he did it would be huge cost millions of dollars to build but it would be huge okay so talk about some incidents first of all all of you know I've done two documentaries missing 411 missing 411 the hunted they're on Amazon and YouTube and you can watch them if you have Amazon Prime guaranteed the hunted's there and you can watch it for free now, when we did the hunted, went to Lima, Ohio, and we did a case there where a hunter saw something that, like you saw in the movie Predator, go tree to tree. You could kind of see through it, you kind of can't. The story has to do with that. It says, Dave, I found your videos years ago and have since followed your work. Your factual news segment and documentaries being my most viewed and appreciated. I've lived in Northwest Ohio for about eight years, the last three of which have been in Lima. The Lima, Ohio experience you showcased in one of your docu documentaries caught my interest when I first saw it, but it soon dropped from my memory as Northwest Ohio doesn't get really forest land in my opinion. Just a few dots of woods here and there, most of which I have thoroughly explored, but a recent experience I had jogged my memory as it had similarities to that female deer hunter's experience. It was around 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. Thursday, June 16th. I was heading back to Lima from my girlfriend's house, 40 minutes west of the city, for an appointment Friday morning. We just had thunderstorms, then two or three days of unusual heat that I'd never felt before. Even the wind was hot. But that's Thursday, the temperature had dropped a little and the sun was shining. So I decided to pull over at Kendrick Woods right outside of Lima for a hike. I normally don't go there as it seems kind of a yuppie-ish place. It's a great little park, very clean, awesome little shelters and barbecues and fires, but the three or four times I had been there in the past, it's been overcrowded and not really my style. I like solitude on my hikes, not screaming kids and suburbanite families everywhere you go. When I arrived, I was surprised to see it was completely empty. Not one car in the parking lot, not one person to be seen. I chucked it up to the heat. I grabbed my stuff, locked my car, then walked around the main park area a bit. When I found the trail map, I studied it and decided to take the longest trail. It starts off as a single trail and then turns into a long ellipt elliptical track that loops back around the main trail. I started heading down that trail and immediately noticed two things. One, the mosquitoes were out. And two, there was a set of six or seven inch bare human footprints in the mud. I was kind of shocked thinking who would walk and let their kids walk barefoot through the mud like this, but I continued on. 
When I came to the split, I took the path to the right, and that was plenty on looping around the way I, on the way back. It was nice, sunny, nice breeze, beautiful summer evening. The bugs seemed relentless and were my only issue. This half of the path was higher on the ground and hilly, but as I rounded the trail, it started to hug a creek and became muddy, overgrown, and a mosquito paradise. So I quickly turned back, deciding the other side would be more of an enjoyable walk. After rounding back around the curve and then walking straight for about two minutes, I started to hear something about 40 to 50 feet in the woods to my right. It sounded like something human or deer-sized, walking through the forest each step crunching leaves. My immediate thought was deer, but there were plenty of deer tracks in the mud, and I even started wondering when the deer would see me and bolt. But as I listened to the distinct two-legged crunching of leaves, I came to the conclusion that it was a person, not a deer. It seemed odd and brought my guard up, causing me to listen more intently to whatever it was that seemed to be walking alongside me in the woods. I noticed there seemed to be a two or three second in between each footfall, sounding like a person picking their way through rough ground. This caused me to think about the bare footprints and Bigfoot, which had me laughing. But as I continued walking, the footsteps kept up with me and even seemed to be getting closer. Eventually being so loud, I stopped and started looking for it to come out of the woods, thinking it sounded like it was very close to me. But as I stopped, it stopped four to sec eight seconds later. So I crouched down and started peering through the trees to see if I could find it. Saw nothing. I thought I saw some movement, but nothing definitive. Eventually, I stood back up and started walking back down the trail a little the way I had just come in an effort to look in the woods down the way. As I started walking, to my surprise, the footsteps in the woods continued too. I walked for about 30 seconds before stopping to peer in the forest and again the footsteps stopped with me. I searched, I searched for a minute or two, once again seeing nothing. At this point the wind picked up and I got an uneasy feeling so I took out my phone, almost like protection. I figured it, if it was a Bigfoot, it definitely wouldn't want to show itself. And it, if I was recording and it was some nefarious human, video can deter that behavior as well. I held my phone out like I was recording and began walking back towards the car. By my third step, the familiar crunch in the forest resumed, this time seeming to be getting closer. Slowly as I walked, at this point I'm starting to get a little mad, so I opened the camera on my phone then abruptly stop and drop into a crouch using the camera to scan the forest and zoom in the area. Once again, the footsteps stop. I stayed crouched for a, a while, scanning the forest. Eventually, the distance muffled sound of a man and a woman talking from behind me down the trail caught my ear and immediately put me at ease. I stood up so they wouldn't catch me crouching, holding my camera out in front of me like an idiot. I debated if I should tell them I think there's some dude creeping around in the woods. But they never came. Instead, the footsteps started again, bringing my attention back to them. This time they seemed off, one every step, three to five seconds. I had my own camera zoomed in on the area I believed it was coming from and started recording. Eventually, I backed out of the zoom and then moved back down the trail where I thought it was. I stopped and began filming the forest looking for it. The footsteps continued sounding sporadic and off, but each crunch getting louder and seemingly closer. The wind picked up and I strained to hear the steps as I searched the forest. Eventually, I heard a distant step that sounded like it was 15 feet away max, which caused me to stop looking through the phone and start looking right in front of me. And then another one came louder, this, this time 10 feet in front of me. I stood there confused, not knowing what to do. Then the last footfall hit the ground at a mere three to five feet in front of me. The shock of it knocking me back three steps, it was the strangest experience of my life. All of my senses told me something just stepped in front of me, but my eyes saw nothing. So what would you do at that point? Would you turn and run? Would you yell? Would you back up a few steps? Would you acknowledge that there was something there to it?
I immediately turned and started walking back to the car, holding the camera pointed behind me in case anything came up from behind. I stopped and turned, watching back a few times before I got far enough down the trail. I felt safe enough to stop recording. I made it to the parking lot, taking one last look at the barefoot prints before exiting the trail. So knowing what you were thinking, seeing the barefoot prints, where's the photo of the barefoot prints? How could you walk away and not take a picture of that? I walked around a bit more before heading to the car than home. Later that evening, I briefly reviewed the video, not seeing anything. The wind seemed too loud to catch the footsteps at the end as well. The only thing odd was a weird glitch that happened probably 60 seconds into recording where it freezes. A line similar to appear down the middle of the screen and then it starts recording again. It was the glitch that reminded me of the experience the deer hunter had in the tree stand and upon thinking that it both cases seemed to be similar. Same location, unseen subject, time of day similar. If I remember correctly, possibly similar time of the year. Both cameras have weird glitches. So I thought I would share. Very odd. Very odd. So there is technology up there. And it's like a blanket. And if I hold the blanket up in front of me, It'll look like I'm not there and you're looking right through me into whatever may be behind me. I don't know how the technology works. It's amazing. It's existed for a number of years. So if you hold it up around you as you're walking, no one would see you. Next letter. I found this rundown of a number of videos hosting sites, including subscriber paid sites, and I thought I'd send it along. With your requirements and the current landscape of video hosting, you may be better off having someone in the village with the know-how create something for you specifically. Many sites right now feel their best bet is to offer something different than what YouTube offers. And those that, oh, don't, uh, and those that want to give an alternative to YouTube are in early stages or just don't want or just don't have what you were looking for. I was hoping a certain site would be a good solution to you, as I've seen many creators that were there, but after looking through their details thoroughly, I found that they don't have everything you need. And that's what happens after you spend two to four hours researching these sites. I don't have the time anymore. I've had sites contact me proactively and when I drill down on them, they don't have what I need. But hopefully somebody out there knows. I've given what I need 10 times in my last video, so you know. I see your frustration level with YouTube rising, understandably, and I plan to follow you when you leave. Thank you for what you do, Dave. I enjoy all the videos you make, and I do my best to get others watching as well. Hopefully, I'll send a more interesting email soon. That was good. I appreciate it. Just validation of what our research has shown. What we're looking for doesn't exist, which is why I'm still here. But I want to be in control of my own destiny. I don't want YouTube to obliterate this channel and me be hanging there in the ether without a home. Hey Dave, hope this finds you and yours well. A little about myself, I was born and raised in Colorado. I still live there on the front range. But next year I'm planning on ending my lease and living out of a van to travel along the Lewis and Clark Historic Trail, starting in Omaha, Nebraska, through to Fort Clatsop, Oregon. While I was out, while I was out the remainder of my lease here. I'm doing research on the Lewis and Clark expedition. During my research, I read one of my books about a strange occurrence that both Lewis and Clark had observed on July 4th, 1805 at the Lower Portage Camp near present day Helena, Montana. On page 247 of the book, Undaunted Courage, Meriwether Lewis, Thomas Jefferson and the Opening of the American West by Stephen Ambrose, 1995, he writes, that evening, Lewis described in his journal a, power, whoop, 
described in his journal a phenomena of the region, a repeated noise coming from the northwest at irregular intervals that resembled precisely the discharge of a piece of ordnance of six pounds at the distance of three miles. The men had often mentioned the sound of it, but Lewis had been sure that they had been hearing thunder until at length walking behind the plains the other day, I heard this noise very distinctly. It was a perfectly calm, clear, and not a cloud in the sky. He stopped and for an hour listened intently. He heard it twice more. I have no doubt, but if I had leisure, I could find it from hence it issued, he wrote. He would hear it again on July 11th and then recalled that the Hindatsas had mentioned such a noise. Clark also heard it, like Lewis. He was certain that there was a rational explanation, although none came to mind. No one since has explained it, but if Lewis and Clark said they heard it, it was there. Ambrose mentions in a footnote that Ken Karzmitsky, the archaeologist from the Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman, who was directing the dig at the lower portage camp, has heard several booms as well. I wonder if you've heard about this phenomenon and if it might be related to the flashes in the woods. No, never heard of it, and can't say that it could be related. I'm an avid watcher of your 411 videos. Keep on fighting the good fight, and apologies for the length of this letter. Not a problem. That is interesting. If you heard a noise that loud back in the early 1800s, that would be amazing. Yeah, today it could be somebody blasting out the side of a mountain. Who knows? You wouldn't know, because you wouldn't see it. Next letter. Hey Dave, I only just discovered your channel, but I've seen some videos that have me thinking. In one of your most recent ones, you talked about veterans and cancer and the missing. I haven't seen many videos, so I apologize if you haven't covered this before and if I haven't found it yet, but have you considered that perhaps the missing don't just only fit the criteria that you've talked about? I have some stories for you. I grew up in Idaho Falls. What a shock that that was considering for my sister joined the army to get the hell out, and so did I. My grandmother has been in Cortez, Colorado since I can remember, and I'm 38. Mesa Verde, when I was a kid, we were always camping, hiding in the wilderness, because hey, we're in Idaho, it's beautiful, we ski, we're always outside. I remember I was standing outside my grandma's house one night and saw this thing go above the trees. It was spherical, it had colored lights, and it just hovered right outside the trees across from her house. I had only gone outside because I was upset because I wasn't being included in the family fun with cousins. I remember being frozen. I was terrified, but I couldn't stop watching the thing hover over the trees. I watched it move from my end of the street to the end of the street silently, and then it was gone. I was frozen until it was gone, and I've told many friends in my family about this. There were so many times that we were hiking that I got a feeling and refused to move. I remember my mother calling me lazy. We used to hike in Little Elk Creek in Idaho every year, and as I got older, I would stop at this one part that we had to cross a log to get over the creek, and I refused to go up that trail. I remember sitting there with my snacks as a teenager, waiting for everyone else to get back. The point of separation freaks me out. Somebody's been paying attention. So we're talking about portals, an entity that has the ability to change your thoughts, right? When I was 16, and she was 18. Oh, wait a minute. Sorry about that. Fast forward 20 years now, and on July thir January 31st, 2020, I lost my sister to cancer. She was in the Army. She was gung-ho in nature and often went off trail. You're missing for one one spark something in me when you mentioned veterans dying of cancer and other things. I have to wonder if there's another aspect to this. So we're talking about portals, an entity that has the ability to change our thoughts, right? When I was 16 and she was 18, she slit her wrists. I was the only one that knew about it. She got in her truck and she drove for 18 hours and 24 hours later, she was in the army. She was diagnosed with melanoma 15 years ago. And the week before she died, she was climbing St. George, Utah. So here it goes. What if there or it or whatever is happening is not only affecting the ones who go missing at the time, but what if something is going on that takes years and years to actually affect the person? So why is the percentage of veterans that die from suicide, cancer, etc., so much higher than others? Let me stop there for a second. 
This kind of makes an innuendo about Skinwalker Ranch. That's important. Why do we discuss Skinwalker Ranch here? Because some of the things at that ranch are directly related to what I'm doing. Pay attention, you'll understand. Now, Travis Taylor, Dr. Travis Taylor, he's got radiation burns there, visual burns on his body. And uh, radiation is cumulative. He could suffer cancer in the future directly related to what he's doing at the ranch. Whatever this is, whatever is happening in the natural parks, what if they are tagging us like we tag game animals to go missing? I've been in the places in the woods that scare the heck out of me. I've crawled all over Mesa Verde and specifically Temple Trail. I brought my husband out there once when we, when we had an 18 month old. We got there, I was excited for my family to see the cave dwellings and they wanted to go down there. But as they were leading, leaving the, on the trail, I got a weird feeling. But I was fine with him and my older girls going down to crawl the dwellings since I spent my childhood crawling all over Mesa Verde, but he said, we gotta go. Now she's six, I still wanted to see the dwellings, but after watching the three differential, I think I know why we wanted to go down there to the dwellings and didn't. I reclimbed Little Elk Creek on Memorial Day 2021 for my sister. It was my oldest brother who was an autistic savant, my mom, her best friend and I, my brother went way ahead of us I hit a point about a half mile past the spot on the trail I've refused to hike in the past. And I looked up that trail and thought, nope. So I turned back with my mom. Friends and my mom went on to find my brother. We all made it back. <clears throat> but my mom and my brother easily could have been another one of your cases. I wanted to share my thoughts about possibly being tagged as humans <clears throat> and being given a death that people wouldn't necessarily correlate. Hope everyone is well. My condolences to you for your son. I know something of that grief and I still can't imagine that. My youngest daughter tried to commit suicide over bullying at school and my oldest recently told, told me I never have to worry about him ever trying because they were too afraid I'd blame myself and follow. What a terrifying thought. Best wishes. I've talked about this before, but I'm going to say it again. Bullying in school is cheap. It's done by the weak and something I can't stand. I think the majority of kids in school have been bullied by in some way at some time. And how to, how to handle that. I think some kids can handle it better than others. But who do I blame? I blame the parents of the bully because they don't know what their kids like. And if they did know and they didn't do anything about it, then I've got a solution for the parents. They need to go to classes to learn how to be a good parent. It bothers me a lot. Bullying has taken the lives of many children in school. No room for that. No wiggle room. My idea if it was a big city, Put all those bullies in one school and let them live with each other. The story is called The Three Iron. When I first read it, it hit me. I'll read it to you. Hey Dave, before I share my story, I'd like to extend my deepest condolences over the loss of your son. I have tremendous respect for you in continuing this endeavor. May God be with you. Now to the occurrence. The story I'd like to share involves my dad and I, of all places, on a golf course. I've been playing golf since I was two years old and I'm now 41. As my golf skills improved, my father would take me down to a course called Rio Rico in Southern Arizona every summer on a regimented weekly basis to play and practice. This particular day in the summer of 94, I was 13 years old and things went as normal through the first four, four holes of the round. My father and I were enjoying our time together on the course in nature. On the fifth hole, I happen to use my three iron on a tee shot to a par three. And to this day, I remember vividly placing the club back into my golf bag. After about 30 minutes later on the seventh hole, I had a shot that required the same three iron. I went to my bag to pull the three iron. It was nowhere to be found. I searched my father's bag as well. There was nothing there inside of his 14 clubs. 
My father came over, searched carefully both bags, and concurred the 300 was missing. My dad was agitated at this point. The club itself was a lot of money for us back then, so we hopped into the golf cart, retraced our steps back to the fifth hole, asking each golfer behind us if they had picked up a club. No luck. We returned to the fifth tee box, searching thoroughly, and no avail. My father was really upset at this point, declaring the club lost, and then decided to drive us the 50 miles north back home. Your dad was upset. We arrived home that afternoon, brought the golf bags into the house, and triple checked their contents, taking each club out of both bags and lining them up on the floor. The three iron was nowhere to be found. My mother even shipped in to help and confirmed that it was missing. We put back all the clubs in the respective bags and gave up all hope of finding a three iron. My dad, presumably to teach me a lesson, told me to call the local pro shop in the morning to order a replacement and that the $70 cost would be coming out of my allowance. I was upset the rest of the day, not understanding how this has happened to me. And subsequently, I stayed up all night reflecting on the event. I mention that because from the vantage point of my bedroom, I would have clearly noticed had anyone left our house in that odd hour of the night. The following morning at on Monday, my father went back to work early as usual at 7 a.m. I called the pro shop as instructed at 9 and asked them to order the custom club. Lead time was two weeks. After the order was placed, I had a very intense urge, almost from an outside force, to go back to the golf bags to check for the missing club a fourth time. I went back into the room to where the golf bags and clubs were stored and looked again in my golf bag. To my sheer astonishment, the three iron was back in my bag where I had left it 24 hours prior. I was in shock. I called my dad who was at work and his reaction to the news confirmed this was not some sort of prank. I assured dad that this was not some replacement three iron. This was the exact custom three iron, which even had the exact light use chip marks on the face and grass marks from the previous round. To this day, my entire family has no explanation as to how that club could have evolved to that point. It defies all logical explanation. On to how this relates to the phenomena you're investigating, I've watched most of your videos and read several of your books. I have a general working theory that whatever is happening has an interdimensional aspect to it. To what degree or to what means to the end remains unclear. I often wonder if perhaps the strangest occurrence was somehow tied to one of these beings, or perhaps tied to some kind of portal that for whatever reason decided to scoop up that three iron and transport it to some place for the better part of 24 hours. I can't say that I recall feeling anything strange or observing anything out of the ordinary on the day in question, but that I can tell you is that that area where this occurred was the most remote section of the golf course, in the densest mesquite trees that back up to, at that time, some national forest land an area so remote that the occasional migratory jaguar has been observed roaming through these areas over the years. That'd be pretty cool to see. Thank you for taking the time to read my story. Wish you well. So why was the, the three iron story important? It disappeared in the presence of two men, or a young man and his dad. Point of separation, where to go? And then it arrives back at a different location, but on the property of the same two men. They never saw anything take it, and they never saw anything bring it back, just like the 411 cases. So what do I think happened to the 300? <laughs> I don't know. Obviously, because they emptied the bags and counted the clubs, it was never there when they were counting. This is a true mystery. So out of the stories, I have three good ones. First one's from the United Kingdom. And uh, if anybody knows where Liverpool is, almost due east from there is where this event happened, and I'm gonna tell you. Individual's name is Thomas Henry Bennett, 40 years old. 
missing November 22, 1925, between 7 and 8 p.m. He resided in a city called Speke, S-P-E-K-E, -E, just out of Liverpool, right here. And this is where the event happened, at, way on the other coast, across the land. So Thomas had gotten over a bad case of influenza, according to the 1925 paper. He was a bachelor, and he had seen a girl in Brid Bridlington, and he had gone there before, and he had gone there on this weekend to go see her. So he and Nellie Vickers, went on a walk on the promenade along the cliffs near Bridlington. And as they were walking along, they had walked for quite a while, maybe an hour. And sometime between 7 and 8 o'clock, when it was very dark outside, Thomas and Nellie were somewhat arm in arm, and he took her, her arm off his, and he took off running. And Nellie said he ran towards the direction of cliffs that entered the ocean. And she specifically stated, I never saw him go off the cliffs. I just saw him run and disappear in the darkness. Her words. He had no history of mental health issues. He was a farmer and speak, very hardworking man. Now, a relative of Mr. Bennett's was a lieutenant in the police, and he was one of the people that took part in the search. Well, after Nellie returned, she told everyone what happened, and she said, yeah, he ran in the direction off a cliff. All these people heard was, he ran off a cliff. Well, when the lieutenant went to the location where Nellie took him, he noticed that this wasn't a very big cliff at all. In fact, it wouldn't have been a cliff. It was a 10 foot high piece of ground that slowly went down to 10 feet. And it, he said it wasn't a cliff, it was a slow, slow downhill gesture that you could run down. And then 15 away from that was the ocean. So even if you had fallen down the cliff, you weren't gonna go in the ocean. Even though that agenda was pushed incessantly by police for weeks. Lieutenant got involved and all of a sudden things started to change. And they started to say, well, where did he go then? So they started searching on the land. And hundreds of people turned out to look for Thomas. Even though this wasn't his home, and he was just staying there temporarily. But it was right on the edge of the ocean. Now, an article a year after this happened stated that Thomas's disappearance was still a high mystery in this part of the UK and that he had never been found. They interviewed a series of witnesses and townspeople and they said he wouldn't have ran into the water and if he would have, he would have survived. He was recovering from inf influenza, so it was odd that he ran. Uh, Nellie was interviewed by the police and this is the story that she told them. But then there was a very strange article in the paper right at the end of the article about Thomas. And it talked about a 1910 incident about a man with the last name of Knight, K-N-I-G-H-T, that disappeared over the same cliffs where allegedly Thomas went over. And then the quote in the paper was, two months later, this man is found on a poultry farm in Australia. And that's all it said. <laughs> you talk about weird. So, was he found dead on the poultry farm? Was he dropped from the sky on the poultry farm? Was he working on the poultry farm? I don't know, <laughs> it didn't say. But it said that he allegedly went off the same cliffs. So kind of the innuendo was, well, maybe Thomas really didn't go off the cliff. Maybe he went into something else. 
But key point, Thomas was a farmer. I've written a lot of cases about a lot of incidents about missing farmers and ranch hands. Can't really tell you why. Sheep herders, same thing. If they're related to a ranch setting, farm setting, a lot of weirdness. So I'll make a long story short, Thomas Henry Bennett, this is him, was never found again. Now, Thomas was described as smart, dedicated, never any mental health issues. He was just getting over some uh, influenza, but generally a super healthy guy, outdoorsman, was in good health. Didn't go off the cliffs, according to a relative that went to that scene. Massive search inland and on the coast and by fishermen in the water, never found. There was a six day search and rescue. What happened to him? And this wasn't the first case, according to the article. This is the second case in the same location where someone disappeared. Weird. Definitely water related. Definitely he had some type of illness or injury. He was never found. The next case is an area that has intrigued me for a long time. Walter Hendrickson, 27 years old, missing August 1st, 1939 from Hermosa, South Dakota. He was a ranch hand and he was described as super reliable, great worker, dependable. His employer was the Charles Lozone Ranch outside of Hermosa. Well, he had worked on the ranch for three years and the family knew they could trust him. So the family decided to take a three week vacation and leave Walter in charge of the ranch. Well, the family had a relative that lived nearby that came by weekly to check on Walter and check on the property, make sure everything was okay. And this brother-in-law came by for their weekly visit and discovered Walter missing. Now, Walter was seen on September 30th, 1939. And then after that, people recognized that things had been moved, animals had been moved, things of ranch type work that was supposed to be done on August 1st. The relative shows up on August 2nd, Walter's gone. So he was still at the ranch August 1st. Calls the local sheriff, local sheriff comes out and immediately puts the pedal to the metal and starts calling out everything imaginable to, so they could start looking for Walter. Well, they brought in equestrian teams, people to pound the dirt. They were looking everywhere. So the star, search and rescue started August 2nd. On August 3rd at 1.30 in the afternoon, the sheriff was working a cattle pond, not large. And they were putting grappling hooks through it and they pulled out Walter's body. They said that there was one mark near one eye. No other, no other obvious signs of injury. They said that this was a relatively small pond that Walter had worked around for three years. Body went to the coroner's office and the coroner stated there was no water in the lungs. He didn't drown. And the weirdest thing I have ever heard is that the coroner stated that the body was partially decomposed. Well, I'm sorry. 36 hours, maybe the body had been missing. No, not going to decompose that much to even note. Now, there was an interesting part to this in that the point of separation, once the family was gone, something happened to Walter. The coroner stated that they couldn't determine the cause of death. Friends, how many times have I told you this? In my cases, that makes no sense. 
the coroner also said there was no obvious signs of serious injury or what might have caused their death, his death. Three year stellar employee. Now, pay close attention. This area, this is Wyoming. Down here is Colorado. Over here is Nebraska. Over here is South Dakota. This incident happened right here at the ranch. Friends, this area on this map, this entire area has so many strange things going on at the same time. I could spend an entire 12 hours talking to you about it. I'm not kidding. A lot of unusual events, a lot of strange disappearances, more than I can even tell you. And I've done videos about missing people on the western side of Nebraska and in this area of Wyoming. When I've said before that it doesn't matter about state lines, country lines, forget it. So if you think that maybe this is some... Um, Maybe it's our government going after people. Eh, it doesn't matter. If it was our government, then they're violating other people's airspace and going into Canada and doing the exact same thing. If it's some state program, well, they're crossing state lines like they're not even there. Now, in that area of Wyoming, I showed you, rolling hills of wheat. Nothing out there. I've known about this for a couple of years. I made some trips through Wyoming, going back to Colorado for different events. Every time I'm driving through there, I got my eyes open. But there's nothing out there. <laughs> Wyoming's a beautiful state with some really big mountains, but none of them are there. And I'm looking to the sky all the time, never seeing anything. But a lot of strange things have happened in that area. Trust me. All right, next case. A uh, man named Felix Sampson, 27 years old, missing September 24th, 1963 at 4 p.m. in Clinton, British Columbia. He was a ranch hand at the Three Bar Guest Ranch, and he was a First Nations member and considered an expert horseman. Well, on September 24th, the ranch said that there were a couple of uh, cows and a bull that disappeared and he had to go out and find them. Do you know how many times I've told you about people that went out looking for cows and bulls that disappeared and they themselves disappeared? It's, it's a very odd coincidence that's happened multiple times. So Felix disappears. And he didn't return that night, which he was, uh, he didn't have any things to stay overnight with, so everyone expected him. So at four o'clock that afternoon, when he wasn't coming back, raised the alarm, the next day the search started. Well, the RCMP brought in airplanes and they started to look all over the countryside. Now when Felix left, he was on horseback and he also brought the ranch dog with him. Two days after he disappeared, on September 26th, the dog wanders into camp. The Three Bar Ranch. You know, too bad you didn't have the dog whisperer there to figure this out. Well, the search and rescue was going. They were into it the second day. At the end of that second day, when the dog returned to the ranch, Late that day, they found Felix, and they found the horse. The horse was tied to a tree about a mile from the ranch, next to a reservoir. And Felix's body was laying next to the horse. They specifically stated that the horse was tied to the tree with a slip knot. And the cowboys stated that a cowboy would never tie a slipknot to secure a horse to a tree. 
and Felix wouldn't have done that. Point number one. Point number two, there was no obvious signs of injury to Felix. But he was obviously deceased. So the RCMP starts searching the area because he's not dressed the way they expected him. 80 feet from the body. It's quite a distance, 80 feet. In a neat folded pile, they find Felix's shaps, his hat, and his blood-stained gloves. Neatly folded in a pile under some brush. The RCMP always has to throw off theories about what might have happened. And their theory was is that he was kicked by a horse. Again, no visible signs of injuries. But why, if he was kicked by that horse, would he stack up all of his things and put them under a bush? Because he wasn't spending the night, so there's no reason to take off your shaps. You wear those while you ride. And here's a picture of Felix, and look what he's wearing. He's wearing that big hat. Most cowboys don't take off their hat when they're riding or when they're working. And I don't suspect Felix took his hat off voluntarily either. Now there was, there was some conversation between the RCMP and the ranch about whether maybe foul play was somehow involved. Because remember, he was looking for missing cattle and a missing bull. Where are those? Why didn't he find them? Why would he tie his, his horse up to a tree? He didn't have a blanket. He didn't have food to spend the night. He had to come back to the ranch. Doesn't make any sense. But as many of these stories don't make sense, I want you to understand that it's hard to, to investigate and read these stories time after time where there's not a finite end to what might have happened. With Felix, he's laying there in the ground dead. There was no articles about anyone doing an autopsy, anybody his body going to the coroner's office. This is pretty much in the heart of British Columbia. So maybe he didn't, I don't know, but they never said anything and there was never a follow-up article. But in this case, he left with his dog. That's important because a lot of these disappearances happen when a dog is there. Two, he's right next to Loon Lake. That's where his body was found. So this is Clinton, BC. His body's found next to Loon Lake. This area of British Columbia, very remote. You can get off the grid here and nobody would probably find you for weeks or ever. So, but he was only a mile from the, from the ran, uh, guest ranch as well. Now, Felix was described as a super dedicated, profoundly efficient horseman and guest ranch host. He was one of the members of the people who took care of the ranch and they had nothing but great things to say about him. But part of that duty is also maintaining the herd that's assigned to the ranch, which is what he was doing that night. And sending him out alone, that's just something every, every cowboy does and they've done it for hundreds of years. But in this instance, something else happened. Now I can tell you in that part of British Columbia, just about everything under the sun that you can imagine weird wise has happened. Number of uh, years ago, probably three or four maybe, I was on a show 
that emanated from British Columbia with a man named Dave Scott. And uh, Dave had me on, we talked about a, a bunch of things. And one of the things that Dave said was, is that area of middle British Columbia down to the uh, North American border and out to the ocean always consistently had some of the strangest things you can imagine. Now, what are some of the things about that area? First of all, it's real thick. Not a big population. Uh, lots of wildlife. And rough country. And brutally, brutal weather that can change on a dime. So, but Felix's issues weren't any of those. It was just very odd. And the RCMP called it a mystery when it was over. They couldn't figure it out. So a couple things. The missing people. I had some comments made by some people. Well, Dave, why are people saying that uh, you don't include every fact of every missing person's case? I'm not sure what they're talking about. I give you all the facts that are relevant. Now, if I put if I pulled out one story out of the thousands of uh, that I've researched and the hundreds I presented to you, just pulled out one, and I told you to research everything you can about it, and you're a good researcher, you're probably going to find things that I missed, because that's just the reality of focusing on one or two or maybe even three. There's always going to be more facts, but you know what? The facts that I give you that stand out, that mat match our profile, they're true. I don't try to fabricate anything, folks. I have enough cases to keep this going for years. There's no reason for me to do this and lie to you. It's just not in my soul. And for the people that have read the books, you won't know. I, I'm not lying because I've had hundreds of you say you fact-checked me on my stories and the stories were right. Yeah. And that's why my reviews on Amazon are so high. Because I don't twist them. Now, do not buy my books on Amazon or eBay. You'll get ripped off. People will charge you way too much. But I would appreciate it that if you've bought one of my books and you've read it, that you go to Amazon and you review it. Because that's where people go before they make a decision about where to purchase. Hopefully they come to our website can am like canadian american can am missing.com you read up about missing people and you can get out our books there our books are 24.99 or 29.99 depending on the book you want compared to ebay and amazon where they're anywhere between 55 dollars and 150 dollars yeah it's ridiculous those are resellers ripping you off those are not me so i appreciate you being here be safe in the summer I always say this at the beginning of summer, especially right now when the waters are high in rivers, wear a life preserver. You're not a pansy. You're not a, you're nothing weak. I've seen so many people drown needlessly. Wear a life preserver. Carry your personal locator beacon while you're hiking and enjoy the great outdoors. Politis out.